Okay, everybody. So today I want to talk a little bit about what we'll be doing in lecture four, which is talking about proof strategies. Okay, we talked about proof tactics in the last lecture. Now we want to talk about proof strategies. Here is a proof strategy is what you try to prove, and a proof tactic is how you decide to prove it. It's worth thinking about both of these when you approach trying to prove a theorem. So let's go over the main proof strategies. In this class, we really have four. The first is direct proof. The second is contrapositive. The third is contradiction. And the fourth will be induction. We're going to hold off for a while on induction, return to it later in the semester. So for now, we're talking about the first three. The basic idea of these three is that we decide which version of the theorem we want to prove. And of course, we need to make sure the thing we are proving is equivalent to the thing that we're trying to prove. A positive statement. So in the direct method, we assume P, and then logic, 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 and then we get Q. If we're able to do that, that is a valid proof. Now, the contrapositive, on the other hand, I'll just write it down. So the contrapositive, if we assume not Q, then we do some logic and we get P. Now, what this, uh, what is crucial in this whole calculation is the fact that we need to know that P implies Q and not Q implies not P are the same thing. Okay, if they're different, then we're in sort of a wild goose chase here because we're not proving the thing that we want to prove. But in this case, it turns out that this is a valid argument. And the reason is, we're going to show this by a truth table. So I'm going to write down the truth table for P implies Q. I'll put not Q, not P, not Q implies not P. Now, let's recall, what are the values of P implies Q? Right? Remember that P implies Q is true in three cases, it's false in one case. So when the assumption is true, the conclusion is false, P implies Q is false. Right? Let's work out these others. So the opposite of Q is, of course, I just flip Q. So instead of going true, false, true, false, I go false, true, false, true. Uh, the flip of P is I just do false, false, true, true. And again, the same story. This is not Q implies not P. So the only place that this is going, this is going to be true in three cases. And the only place it's not going to be true. Okay. And that's crucial to all this. These columns are the same which means these are equivalent propositions. So proving not Q implies not P is exactly the same as proving P implies Q. That's why the contrapositive is valid. The last thing we have is contradiction. We assume P and not Q. So we assume that the assumption of the theorem is true, the conclusion is false, and then we show that this cannot happen. We do some logic or whatever, and then we get something that is absurd or a contradiction. And that just can't be true. Okay. Once we have that, then we know that P and not Q is false. Okay. And that is going to tell us that it's not possible for the assumption to be true and the conclusion to be false. Therefore, if the assumption is true, the conclusion is true, which is really what we need. Okay, so, all right. So to demonstrate on uh, paper, so, so to speak, is I want to think about one particular theorem. So here's a theorem and it goes like this. If X plus three is even, 
Right? That's what I want to prove. So let's think carefully about what the assumptions of the conclusions are here. Okay. So in this case, so now if we try to prove these each of these three ways, let's go ahead and prove this. Let's start off with um, let's start off with the direct proof. So what I do is I assume x plus 3 is even. Remember, the proof strategy for the direct proof is assume p and then do some logic to get q. So what does it mean? What does it mean for x plus 3 to be even? x plus 3 is even means x plus 3 equals 2k for some k, which after a little bit of algebra, this means x equals 2k minus 3. Again, k is still an integer. Same k, minus 4 plus 1. It might seem like a weird way to break this up, but certainly I can do that. But the reason I do that is so I can factor out a 2. And you can see I've written x as 2 times an integer plus 1. Therefore, x is odd. And we're done. That is the direct proof. We assumed, and remember, the way contrapositive works is we assume not q. I'll slide down here just so we can see. We assume not q. So I assume x is even, right? The negation of x being odd is x is even. So that means x equals 2k for some k in the integers. So what does that mean? Well, that means x plus 3 is 2k plus 3. I'll factor the 2 in here. This is 2k plus 2 plus 1. And this is 2k plus 1 plus 1. That shows me that x plus 3 is odd. I want to assume p and not q. Okay? So, what I want to assume, I'll just slot up again just to see it again, p is x plus 3 is even, not q is x is even, so I'm going to assume, to break this out, I'm assuming x plus 3 is even, and x is even. If x equals 2L, then I have 2K. Oops, sorry. 2K plus 3 equals 2L, or 2K minus L equals 3, which means K minus L equals 3 halves. And let's think about that. That is a contradiction. There's no way that can happen, right? Because remember, K and L are integers. Integers cannot differ by three halves. It's very natural to ask when we have all of these different strategies, which one should we employ in a given situation? And there isn't a perfect rule for this, but there's some rules of thumb. The first rule of thumb is that when the Q is more specific than the P, okay, and I'll show a couple of examples like this, that signals that we want to use the contrapositive. The reason is because remember, in the positive version, in the direct proof, we start with P and go to Q, whereas in the in the contrapositive, we start with not Q and go to not P. So if Q is more specific, then not Q will be more specific, and we'll have more to sort of sink our teeth into at the beginning. That's a little bit vague, but maybe go with it. And another thing is when we have very little information, it's usually a good idea to go with contradiction. Uh, we'll do a few examples of each of these as well, but again, just to get some ideas about rules of thumb. Now, finally, we talked about P implies Q. What do we do in the case where we have a biconditional? So P, if and only if, Q. Okay. So there are two major ways that we can typically do this, okay? And if you recall, this is something that we did in our in-class exercise um, last week. So one fact is that P, if only if Q, is equivalent to P implies Q and Q implies P, right? So the interpretation of this is that when I say P, if and only if Q, it means P and Q are equivalent. It means I can go from left to right and I can go from right to left. That's the interpretation of that. But another interpretation of P if and only if Q is something like P implies Q and not P implies 
not cute. Okay. So to say this, maybe using a little bit of our terminology, we can prove two things. We can prove the positive version, we're saying here, and the converse, that's one choice. Or we can prove the positive version and the inverse. Okay. And the reason we can do both either of those is because the converse and the inverse are equivalent because they're contrapositive of each other. So we can do these two, right? And in fact, there's actually two other things we could do. We could also replace either positive with a contrapositive, and that would be okay, right? So for example, there's really sort of four combinations we could do if we really wanted to. We could do the positive and the converse, the positive and the inverse, the contrapositive and the converse, and the contrapositive and the inverse. But here's what we can't do. And I always wanna make this point very explicit, is this is not acceptable. We can't do the positive plus the contrapositive. That's not okay, right? And the reason that's not okay is because the um, the positive and the contrapositive are equivalent. So to prove the contrapositive, once we've proved the positive, we're not adding any more information. What I guess the way to think about this is, you know, just think of it as there's out of the four ways to write a theorem. You know, the positive, the converse, the inverse, and the contrapositive. Two of them are equivalent, and the other two of them are equivalent. And so to prove the biconditional is you want to do one from each group. And I'm going to prove the following theorem. So let M and N be integers. So again, it's an if and only if. So we have to prove this in two directions, or we have to do two things, okay? But let's just think a little bit of what this means. So first of all, when it says M and N are both odd, that's one assumption, the conclusion is MN is odd. So whenever we take two odd numbers, multiply them together, we get an odd number. But the if and only if also tells us we can go in the other direction, meaning that if we have a product that's odd, then we're guaranteed that each of the two terms must also have been odd themselves. So if you have an even number in there anywhere, you don't get an odd product. So let's go ahead and start to prove this. And I claim that the best way to do this is to do P implies Q first, and then do not P implies not Q second. Okay? I'll say a few words about when we're done, why to do it this way, but this is one way to do it. So let's go ahead and do this. So here's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to assume, just do a direct proof here, assume M is odd. So that means M equals 2K plus 1 for some integer. N equals 2L plus 1 for some other energy. Okay? Okay. Well, let me now just go ahead and compute. M times N is what? 2k plus 1 times 2l plus 1, right? Which is, remember, FOIL, 4kl plus 2k plus 2l plus 1. And I see how this is shaping up. Notice that the first three terms are all divisible by 2. In fact, we can pull out a nice 2 in this way. And notice that even though this thing is complicated, this 2KL plus K plus L, this is an integer, right? Therefore, MN is odd. I say, well, how do I know it's M? It could be N. But remember, M and N, they're just letters. So, if you gave me one even and one odd number, I'm just saying, let's just call the even one M, right? We're not making any special assumptions here because M and N are just arbitrary letters anyway. So if we have M equals 2K, because that's what it means for M to be even, well, M times N is 2KN, which is 2 times KN, which of course is even. So what have we concluded? Mn is even, which of course is not cute. 
So let's go ahead, let's go back really quick. What is Q? Q is MN is odd. So let's go. Let's try that. So assume MN is odd. Okay, what does that mean? That means MN equals 2K plus 1 for some K in the integers. Okay. And what do you do? Right? It's kind of tricky, right? I mean, so um, M times N is 2K plus 1, but I, I, you know, I can't factor the right-hand side in any meaningful way. I can't. Like there's just sort of nothing to do, right? So you just end up kind of stuck. Now, I, I kind of knew that was gonna happen because because I sort of saw that going. So it's not 100% clear the first time you do this why you wouldn't have tried this, right? You have to sort of get stuck in this way a couple of times, but that's a reasonable thing to, to do, okay? So again, the idea here, remember, is that, and I'll scroll back a little bit, Right, is that when we have p if and only if q, we can assume we can, we can we can do the forward and the backward direction if you like, or we can do the forward direction and the um, the inverse, the negation of these terms in that direction, and that works. Okay, so now we're going to prove one more thing. We're going to prove a thing called a corollary, and so the corollary is that n and n squared have the same pattern, are both odd, or both even, which another way of saying that is breaking that up into two statements to saying n is odd if and only if n squared is odd and n is even if and only if n squared m equals n. If m equals n, then the original theorem says n odd, right? Because m and n are equal, so they're both odd, if and only if n squared is odd. That was easy enough. Now, what about the other case? Well, let's think about this, right? We have proved P if and only if Q, where P is N odd, Q is N squared odd, okay? So what if P is false? Well, not P. How do we prove not P implies not Q? Because that would that would say N even implies N squared even. Well, not P implies not Q is the same, right? This is equivalent to Q implies P, right? Because if you like, this is the inverse of the original proposition and that's the converse and they're equivalent, okay? But Q implies P is already part of P if and only if Q. Similarly, not Q implies not P Contrapositive of that is P implies Q. So in fact, what I'm trying to say here is that we actually don't have to do any more work. We are actually done. But we can also do it directly. So let's assume N is even, all right? So what does that tell us? Well, if N is even, N equals 2K for some K in Z. which implies n squared equals 4k squared. But of course, that equals 2 times 2k squared. And if k is an integer, then 2k squared is an integer. So this is also even, right? Similarly, if n squared is even, and n squared is not odd, okay? But scrolling back just a little bit, we have right here that n squared is odd if and only if n is odd. If n squared is not odd, that implies n is not odd, which implies n is even. 
Here's another theorem that someone might ask us to prove. And you may have seen this proof before, but I'll just go ahead and go over it. So theorem, square root of two is irrational. Now it turns out this is this is a really important mathematical fact. Um, and you might have heard the story, but one of the reasons that, that this, this was a very important fact to show that irrational numbers exist. And where this comes from is you may remember that Pythagoras' theorem, that I can always construct a square root of two from a triangle. If I have a triangle, right triangle, where each of the two sides is equal to one, then Pythagoras' theorem tells me that the hypotenuse is square root of two, okay? And, you know, when the Greeks sort of figured this out, the ancient Greeks back, the Pythagoreans, or a group of ancient Greeks about 2,500 years ago, when they discovered this, this really bothered them, right? Because they thought all numbers were rational. And, and, and well, here's something that comes from a perfectly reasonable thing, a triangle, and it's a number that's not rational. It's not able to be written as P over Q, right? And that's really what that means. So that means square root of two uh, cannot be written P over Q. So, how are we gonna prove this? Remember one of the things I said early on, one rule of thumb, is that when you don't have much information, try to do a proof by contradiction. Just give it a shot, okay? Because basically, which, you know, because the thing is, is that to prove a contradiction, you just have to contradict anything else in mathematics you know. So in a sense, you, you have a lot of things you can contradict against. So when you have sort of less information, you kind of go with a proof by contradiction. So what does the proof by contradiction say here? Well, let's assume the square root of two equals P over Q. That would be a contradiction of, of, of the theorem. And then we'll see if we can, that, that's literally the negation of the theorem, see if we can come up with a contradiction. Okay, now let's assume also, assume this is in what's called lowest terms. And so lowest term meaning Right, it means it's a proper fraction, as, as you probably know the terminology before, is that P and Q have no common factors, right? Okay, so let's assume that and just see where it takes us. Okay, well, if this equation is true, I can multiply both sides by Q. Q times square root of two equals P. Square both sides of this equation, and I get P squared equals two Q squared, right? So if square root of two equals p over q, then p squared equals two q squared. No problem. What does that tell me? That tells me that p is even, right? Because p is two times an integer. I'm sorry. That tells me that p squared is even because p squared is two times an integer, right? It's two times q squared. Okay. Now remember what we just proved. We just proved that if p squared is even, this implies the p is even, okay? So that means p equals 2k for some integer k that hasn't appeared anywhere yet. So I can use the letter k. And what does that tell me? Well, if I take p equals 2k and plug it into this equation, I get 4k squared equals 2q squared. Divide both sides by 2, and I get 2k squared equals q squared. What does that tell me? That tells me that q squared is even, and by the previous proposition, that tells me that q is even. So what have we concluded? We've concluded that p is even, and q is even. But we also assumed over here that p and q have no common factors. They can't possibly both be even because then they would both be divisible by two and they would have a common factor. And this is now what we call contradiction. Okay, so contradiction is a good thing and a bad thing in a way. When we get to a contradiction, we know something that we did was wrong because we've come up with a contradiction. There's no way all of this can be true, right? It cannot be true that P and Q have no common factors and P is even and Q is even, not possible. 
Those three things are, are contradictory. So we come up with a contradiction. So that means that we've assumed something in our argument that must be false. Now, the beauty of this here, and here's, here's where the proof by contradiction really, here's where the rubber really hits the road. Is when you do a proof by contradiction, you gotta be careful not to assume too many things. We've only assumed one thing in this proof. We've only assumed one thing, and that is right here. We've assumed that the square root of two was rational. Okay, since that's the only thing we've assumed and we've attained a contradiction, that tells us that that is the thing that is false. Therefore, this has proved the theorem. And I will say one, one way in which I see people, if you like, make a mistake or, or one way people do proof by contradiction incorrectly is what they do is they will sort of maybe assume more than one thing, maybe two or three things, and then obtain a contradiction. And so now you know one of the things you assume is wrong, but you don't know which one, right? So here we were careful to only assume one thing and to obtain a contradiction, meaning that was the one thing that was wrong. Okay, I wanna make one last example, one last example. Um, and this is an example where uh, this is something where, where contrapositive sort of pops out at you. And here's here's a theorem. So let me write this theorem. Theorem. So let's let K and L be integers. Okay. Um, if K plus L is odd, then one of K L is even, and the other is that's up there. This is the statement P, K plus L is odd. The statement Q. Okay, so remember, this is a P implies Q situation. There's three things we could do, three strategies. We can directly prove it, assume P, deduce Q. We can do contrapositive, we can do contradiction. So here's what I'll say. If you look at the statement P, and you look at the statement Q, the statement Q is a little bit more specific, a little bit more concrete. It's telling you something about the numbers K and L themselves, whereas P is only telling you something about the sum. It's a little bit less specific. This suggests doing a proof by contrapositive because Q is more specific. So starting with Q or its negation is going to be better than starting with P, which is what? Which is that, what's the negation of Q? Well, if, if Q is the statement that one of these is even, one of them is odd, the negation of that is that both of them are even or both of them are odd. Both even or both odd, right? And so let's just, and then now let's put that up in the cases. Well, if K and L are even, what do we have? K equals 2A, L equals 2B, K plus L equals 2A plus 2B, which equals 2a plus b, and that is even, right? Which again, is not p. k plus l is not odd. Similarly, if k, l, both odd, k equals 2a plus 1, l equals 2b plus 1, k plus l equals 2a plus 2b plus 2, slightly different, but again, the 2 pulls up. And that is even. So in either case, when K and L, the way I say this, if K and L have the same parity, remember parity is, is whether they're even or not, but they have the same parity, both even, both odd, their sum is even, okay? Which is not P. So we've assumed not Q, we've deduced not P, and that proves that they're. All right, so now, we're going to cut to the lawyers again, and the lawyers are going to show us a bad proof. So now we're back. And I want to show the bad proof, right? What is the bad proof? 
n squared has to be less than or equal to n because n is the greatest integer. If n squared were bigger, n would not be the greatest integer. So we get this. From that, we could just do a little bit of algebra. We get n squared minus n is less than or equal to zero. A little more algebra and factor that. And now we have a product of two numbers that's less than or equal to zero. It's not possible for both of them to be positive. One of them must be zero or negative, right? Because if they're both positive, their product would be positive. Therefore, this tells us that n is less than or equal to one. That seems like a proof, right? All this algebra looks legit, right? And everything is legit here except one thing. So one way to think about this is this sort of looks like it's a proof by contradiction, right? We've ended up with something that contradicts what we know. We know that not every integer is less than or equal to one, so we've attained a contradiction. So what assumption did we make here? I don't see the word assume anywhere. Here's a tricky. Sometimes there's implicit assumptions when you don't use the word assume, right? I mean, saying consider n squared, n squared less than one, that's just algebra, there's no assumption here. We'll just be careful. Look right here. I said, let n be the greatest integer. When I say let something be something, I'm making the implicit assumption in that sentence that the thing exists, right? Let s be a set with something, or let this be that. Let, it's like we're assuming that the thing exists. So if there were a greatest integer, then n could be denoted as that, and everything here would be perfectly kosher. But I've assumed something that's not true, right? So there's two ways to think about this argument. One of these arguments, one way of thinking about this argument is that it's just kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a fancy way of tricking you into showing that n is less than equal to one for every integer. Well, we see that that's wrong. We know that that's an illusion. But this is also, if you like, a proof by contradiction that there is a greatest integer, right? Because if there were a greatest integer, this proof would be perfectly valid and it would have to be one. And we know there's integers bigger than one. We have two. So this is, this is if you like, a, a false proof of something, or you could think of it as a proof by contradiction, as long as you're careful about what your assumption really is. All right. And I'll finish up on one last uh, bad proof, if you like. Here's a theorem I want to prove. And that is that every number is equal to zero. That sounds a little shady, all right? So how are we gonna prove that? Let's go ahead and prove this, okay? So here's here's a proof. So uh, take X and Y to be two numbers, but they're equal, all right? I'm gonna multiply both sides of this equation by X, and we get X squared equals XY. That seems legit. I'm going to subtract y squared from both sides of this equation. I can certainly do that. I'm doing the same thing to both sides of this equation. I can factor both sides of this equation. And remember, x minus y, x squared minus y squared is x minus x plus y times x minus y. Here I just pull out the y. Okay, just algebra. Let me cancel those terms. They're the same on both sides. So I get x plus y equals y. All right. Remember, x equals y. So I can just replace this x with a y. So that tells me that 2y equals y. Got both sides by y. Subtract 1 from both sides, I get 1 equals 0. And then multiply both sides by n. I get n equals zero. What? Okay, so that's not true. There is a mistake in this proof and it's maybe subtle. If you've seen it before, maybe you know it, but I'll lead everybody to think about this and I'll end the lecture here.